I am very thankful to be here with us all, and I'm especially grateful for this particular Sabbath and for the succeeding Sabbaths going forward because we are really going to touch on something that I believe is very necessary in such a time as this in Earth's history. We're going to be talking quite a bit about the sealing work and its order. The great purpose in this time in Earth's history is that we are preparing for one of two things, and they're riddled in Bible prophecy. People are preparing right now either to receive the mark of the beast or they are preparing to receive the seal of the living God. And if I were to ask a question, how many of you would like the mark of the beast, please raise your hands. I'm sure I would see no hands go up because you're an intelligent group of people. And we know that whether we know what the mark of the beast is or isn't, one thing we can all agree on is it's got to be bad. But when it comes to the seal of God, that is the only thing that is opposite to the mark of the beast. And the seal of God should be something that every child of God wants, is to be sealed with the seal of our living God. And so we're going to talk about some of those principles and, and, and really get into what's the key thing that makes it all work. And so my hope and my prayer is that we will be thoroughly blessed as well as challenged as we go through our study together. So please, if you will, I'm going to kneel to have a word of prayer. And if you are able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me. If you can't kneel, just bow your heads reverently, but let us all pray together as we receive the word. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the blessing and the gift of life. We thank you so much for bringing us safely through another week. And we thank you, dear God, for this opportunity that we may hear your voice, and that we will follow you as you lead. And Lord, we're praying that you will please have mercy upon us in any area where we have failed and fallen short of your glory and have sinned against you. We ask you to please pardon us and also give us a fresh endowment of your Holy Spirit, that we might have power from on high to do not our will, but your will, and so let your will be done. And so now speak to our hearts, we pray, and make your words plain to us, for we do ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say Amen. It was in the beginning of time that the Bible, after Adam and Eve, we began to have a populated world. And when we study the Bible carefully, you will find that the Bible shows that there were two worshipers, two worshipers. And the two worshipers are very important for us to understand because the same way that, and when we talk about two worshipers, we're not just dealing with people, but we're also dealing with mindset. And when we look at the mindset, we're going to notice that what took place in the beginning of time is going to take place in the last moments in Earth's history. When we look at these two worshipers, they can be broken down as Cain and Abel, two worshipers. And then there was, of course, those who get the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Again, two worshipers. So one of the first things we need to notice is that as our world began with two worshipers, our world is going to close with two classes of worshipers. Everybody is going to worship. But the reality is that some will worship right and others will worship wrong. If we are intelligent children of God, which I am safely assuming we are, the goal is that we want to be part of those who worship God right and not those who worship God wrong. If I am correct in that assumption, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right. So now considering that, let's go ahead and let's take a look at it. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter four. Let's look at something about these two worshipers in Genesis chapter four. The Bible prepares us to see something that is very important because as we see it in the beginning, we're going to see it replete throughout ancient history, and then we're ultimately going to see it apply even in the last days of Earth's history. Because this is a lot of verses, what I'll do is I'll read verse 1, you'll read verse 2, I'll do verse 3, you do verse 4, and we'll take it down to verse all the way to 10. The Bible says in Genesis, we're looking at chapter 4, starting at verse 1. It says, And Adam knew his wife 
and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. You do verse 2. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, please notice that in this story, you have two brothers. And this is the first time that we see brother persecuting brother. You know, the first warfare was in family. Isn't, isn't that interesting? The first war to take place in heaven was amongst family. And the first war to take place on earth was amongst family. And here we have a story of a brother persecuting another brother. And the reason was that one brother's deeds were good and the other brother's deeds were not. They both were worshipers. They both came with their offerings. But one offering was accepted and the other offering was rejected. Now, let us go ahead and now let's take a look at Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Let's go ahead and fast forward down to the very closing scenes of Earth's history. Revelation 14, now we're looking at verses 9 to 11. And then we're going to look at Revelation 7, 1 to 3. Revelation 14 first, verses 9 to 11. And let us go ahead and let's see what the Bible says here, because God is trying to paint a picture. What we're seeing from the past has something to do with you and I today. It says in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. If you're there, please say amen. amen. All right. It says in Revelation 14, starting at verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So notice that the last day picture is that there's going to be a group of people that are going to have something called the mark of the beast. And by having that, they suffer what's called the wrath of God. It's going to be a very different kind of wrath because it says that this wrath is unmixed. Normally, when God would distribute his wrath unto a people, he would mix it with mercy. You know, if you listen, you could escape it. And we see examples of that, like when God would judge Egypt and so on. There were Egyptians that was able to get out of Egypt. But here God is doing this judgment without mixture. In other words, it's their last chance. But now let's look at Revelation 7. What is the contrast to this picture? In Revelation 7, we get a contrast to this picture of those who receive, quote unquote, the mark of the beast. And keep in mind it said, worship the beast. So that means that whoever has the mark of the beast, they're still worshipers. Don't lose that. Now we're looking at Revelation 7. In Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3 now, let's go ahead and let's consider what the scripture says here. Again, this is a closing picture. This is the picture of God's people living at the closing scenes of earth's history. It says in Revelation 7, 1 to 3, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2. 
And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the tree nor the sea, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So notice that in the last day picture that God gives, there's going to be two class of worshipers. The same way that in the beginning, two class of worshipers is the same way in the end, two class of worshipers. The beginning is not as much concerning to you and I because that's past truth. But this last day picture in Revelation 14 should be very concerning to you and I because that's present truth. It's truth for this time. And notice that it shows in the last days, that's how literally humanity will be divided. Either seal of God or mark of beast. Now, how many of you want the mark of the beast? Remember, I said raise your hand and, no, and nobody's going to raise their hand, right? Amen, because you're a very wise group of people. But let me see this. How many of you want the seal of God? Let me see your hands. You want the seal of God? Amen. Now, I want you to, there's, there's something my father used to say to me. I remember going to my dad and I, I evidently harassed him. I didn't even realize I was harassing him. But, you know, all I wanted was a toy. You know, I was just trying to get a toy car. And, you know, and, and, and I, I would make my father stop sometimes. You know, my father was the kind of man that loved to please his son. And so there are times I say, Daddy, can we stop here? I want to get a car. And he would say, Dwayne, we cannot do that. And I'll say, okay. And then we'll go someplace else. Dad, can we stop here? I, I want to get a car, a toy car. And dad would say, son, we cannot do that. And then I'm like, okay. And then we went by this store. It was called TSS. And this is an old store. That store is very much gone. And I remember going by TSS and I started smiling because I knew exactly where the toy car uh, area was. And I remember saying, Dad, can I please go there and get a car? And, I, and I, he said, Dwayne, what is wrong with you? Why do you keep asking me when I already told you no? And I said, because I really want it. And then my father said this to me. He didn't even realize he was dropping a wisdom key in my mind. He said, Dwayne, he says, let me tell you something. Now, please understand my father was not a strong Bible believer or anything like that. So he was just saying the best of what he understood. But I still got the point. My father looked at me and he said, Dwayne, listen, people in hell want ice water, but that doesn't mean they're going to get it. <laughs> and I remember my father said that. So, you know, at first I'm kind of scratching my head like, what does that have to do with a car? But then I got it. He was saying, in other words, just because you want something does not mean by default you get what you want. Just because you want it. And so I remember my dad saying that, and I was like, oh, now I got it, Dad. And that, that just never left my mind. We could want something very badly, but that doesn't mean we get it just because we want it. You got to qualify for it. You got to be in the position to receive it. And so as beautiful as it is that this crowd here, you all just said it so wonderfully. You said, look, I want the seal of God. Well, you're in a good place. Want is a good start. It's just a bad finish. Don't lose that. Want is a good start, but it's a terrible finish. I can want to be a good husband all throughout my marriage. Sooner or later, I must transition from wanting to be a good husband to actually being a good husband. I could want to be a good father to my children, but sooner or later, I have to pass from wanting to be that to actually being that. I can want to be a good pastor, but I got to transition from a point where I want to to actually being that. Want is a great start. It's just a horrible finish. Sooner or later, we have to go from wanting something to choosing to being something. Now watch this. One of the lessons that we learn right from history, right from the jump, is this. Number one, the lost group, please notice this. The lost group did some of what God said mingled with their own will. Don't lose that family. Why is it that Cain was out of the favor of God? Did Cain worship? Did God want him to worship? Sure. Did Cain present offerings? Did God want offerings? 
So in other words, Cain was doing some of God's will. There was some things about what God required that Cain was doing it. But did Cain offer what God told to be offered? No, he did not. Remember this. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let me show you something from the Bible. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Remember, they were presenting these offerings because they wanted to receive atonement, forgiveness of sin. But let us remember something that the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. We're considering chapter 9. And this is a forever principle. This, this principle was in the beginning of time as well as in the days of the book of Hebrews as well as today in the last moments of earth's history. It is in Hebrews chapter 9 that the Bible lets us know the most essential ingredient for our sins to be forgiven. The Bible spells it out beautifully in Hebrews chapter 9. Notice what it says in verse 22. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible says, And almost all things are by the law purged or cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is what? No remission of sins. Sin cannot be forgiven without blood being shed. So when Cain presents his offerings, what did he offer? He offered the fruit of the ground. There's no blood in fruit. There's no blood in vegetables. But when Abel's offering came, Abel's offering was the shedding of the blood of an animal. And that animal was to represent that lamb of God that was to take away yours and my sins. Amen? So watch this. So what we learn from Cain, which we also will learn from those with the mark of the beast, is that the lost group, they did do some of what God says, but they mingled their own will with it. And God says, offering rejected. Now let's understand Abel. When we think about Abel, the saved group did exactly what God said and their will was completely surrendered. That's the saved group. So you remember I asked you that intelligent question. I asked you that intelligent question earlier. I said, how many of you want the mark of the beast? And you were very wise people. You, none of you raised your hands. But then I asked the next question, which was, okay, well, how many of you want the seal of God? And then all of you raised your hands. But we all learned something from my father. Just because you want something doesn't mean you get it. You got to fit the criterion that enables you to receive the blessing. What we're learning is the difference between Cain and those of the mark of the beast and Abel and those with the seal of God is that Abel and those with the seal of God, they got to a place that they said, Lord, whatever you say, I will do it. I will not do some of what you say. I will do exactly what you say. And I will not mingle my will with it. I will surrender it. So if we want that seal of God, God is more than happy to give it to each and every one of us family. God has no problem with that because God loves to bless us and he hates to curse us. But God wants us to understand the only way to receive this is we must meet the criterion and we must be willing to do what Abel did. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because the Bible is very clear. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. That's why I'm telling you what happened in principle, during the days of Cain and Abel, is what is going to take place amongst God's people in the last days. Cain and Abel were God's people. Those in Babylon, as well as those in the remnant, they're all God's people, right? That's why God says to those in Babylon, come out of her, my people. So we're all going to hear this message, and those who do exactly what God says, oh my, what blessings, what blessings, seal of God. But those who do some of what God says, but are still holding on to their own ideologies and their own plans and their own will, God says, I am sorry, but your offering is rejected. And we don't want to be rejected. So please pay attention to this amazing trend. You know, the Bible is filled with lots and lots of powerful trends. Lots and lots of powerful trends. Go to Matthew 24. Let me show you something. 
In Matthew, the 24th chapter, we see a powerful trend. I mean, just powerful. And I want you to watch it because there's something stated in Matthew 24 that sometimes we, we don't necessarily consider it, but we should. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider verse 37. Matthew, we're looking at chapter 24, and I want us to see what the text says in verse uh, 37. And let's watch what the Bible says here. In Matthew 24 and verse 37, the Bible says, but as the days of who? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also be the, sunning of the, the coming of the Son of Man. So notice that Jesus says, if you want to know what the world's going to be like around my coming, when I'm, when I'm getting closer and coming nearer, Jesus says, just remember the days of Noah. Whatever was going on in the days of Noah, you're going to see the same things happening in my day, in those days. Now, here's the deal. Correct me if I'm wrong. Often when we read this verse, do we not think of the wicked? Correct me if I'm wrong. When we think of as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. The first thing that comes to our mind is all the wickedness that was happening in the days of Noah. Isn't that right? We think of every ungodly thing that they were doing, which was a lot. But guess what? If or since the coming of Christ and shortly before that will be like the days of Noah, then that means that there's going to be people on earth that will be like Noah. Do you agree with that? So I prefer to focus on positive rather than negative. I want to focus on Noah because our goal is not to be like the wicked antediluvians. Our goal is to be like that righteous Noah. And can I, I want to show you something about Noah. And I guarantee you, if you get the message, family, you have no idea the amount of showers of blessings God is getting ready to pour on you and your house. This is why you need to pray and ask God to help your mind stay focused on the message. Because I know that what I'm about to share with you is ever so present truth. It is what the people of God need right now. Let's talk about Noah. If we look carefully at Noah, this man of God, here's what God said about Noah. Now, please watch this. Whatever God said about Noah is what he wants to say about his people in the last days of earth's history. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in Genesis 6 and verse 9, Noah was a what kind of man? Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Praise God. That's how the Bible describes him. In fact, later on, the Bible says this in the book of Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So why was Noah allowed to come into the ark? How did God see him? He saw him as righteous. Would you agree with that? That's what the text says. Now, here's my question. Who else went into the, into the ark with him? So that means that no, God did not just see that Noah was righteous. God also saw that Noah's family was what? Was righteous as well. In fact, if you look carefully at the works of Noah, the Bible spells it out like this. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his what? house and by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith you know what i thought was very interesting about the days of noah in noah's preparation for what was coming according to prophecy noah prioritized his house in preparing for what was coming in the world while Noah preached to a lot of people, Noah prioritized his house. And God was so impressed, if I can use such a word, God was so impressed by what Noah did that God actually enabled him and endowed him with his righteousness, which Noah received by faith. 
not only Noah, it was Jesus himself. When Jesus walked on this earth, brothers and sisters, remember this. The Bible makes it very clear. Let, let's notice what Jesus was when he came on this earth, right? The Bible spells it out beautifully in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice what it says next. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? The form of a what? Now, let's pause right there. Keep, go, to, go back to Revelation 7. Let me show you something. I, I'm, I'm going to give you an open book test. I'm going to see how good you all did in school. Because, you know, when you fail an open book test, that, that wasn't good. You know, I mean, if you fail a closed book test, okay, yeah, you got to remember stuff and everything. But, man, I mean, when it's an open book test, you're not supposed to fail an open book test, you know? But I want you to see something. Open book test. Revelation 7. Look at verse... In Revelation 7 and verse 3, when it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the tree nor the seas, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Question. According to the verse... Who are the people that get the seal? Because remember, we said we want to get the seal. So according to the verse, who are the people that get the seal? What must be done in order to get the seal? You got to serve. That's clear, isn't it? So guess what? If you want the seal, but you're not serving, no seal. See how clear that is? That's like clear, right? That's like, boom, real clear. If we are not serving God and serving our fellow man, then we, by default, don't get the seal. So it's all right to want the seal. Again, but remember, people can want a lot of things. It doesn't mean by default they get it. You got to be in the position for the blessing. And the position that God has shown us is if you want the seal, then you need to serve. Now, what are we learning about Jesus? Though he took upon him, though he was not ashamed that he had equality with God, he took upon him the form of a what? A servant. Was Noah a servant? Yes. Now watch this. It says, it took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now here's something I discovered about Jesus that was absolutely mind-blowing. Let's take a look. When you think about Jesus' service to humanity... We think about things like feeding the 5,000. We think about him healing the blind, the lame, the dumb, and the sick. These are the things we think about when we look at the ministry of Jesus. But let me show you something about the ministry of Jesus that sometimes we never, ever gave it thought. You'll remember that after Jesus was anointed, the Holy Spirit came down to him. Remember John the Baptist baptized him, comes out of the water. Voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Remember that? Now watch this. When that happened, I want you to see something here. Very powerful. The Bible said this in Luke 3. Don't lose this point. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, it says the heaven was opened. Then... And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And I like this part. It says, And Jesus himself began to be about how old? So how old was Jesus when he got baptized? 30 years old. Okay? So here's my question. Do you think Jesus started his servanthood when he was 30 and when he was anointed? Is that when he started it? No, definitely not. So the question is this. When did Jesus start serving? And the answer is, it was his home. His first place of service was his home. Now, I want you to notice this. In Matthew 2, there's something the Bible says that's very powerful about Jesus. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So where did Jesus live? Nazareth. That, that was where his home was. Would we agree? Yeah? Amen. Now watch this. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. This is after Mary and Joseph took their eyes off of Jesus. It took three days to find him. Then when Mary and Joseph bring him back, then here it is that the Bible says 
that as he told them, I must be about my father's business, after Jesus gave that gentle rebuke, because Jesus, when he said to Mary and Joseph, I must be about my father's business, he was indirectly letting them know you weren't. Are you following that? We call that a gentle rebuke. Children are allowed to gently rebuke even their parents. And here it is that this gentle rebuke is coming. But what does the Bible say after he gives this gentle rebuke? It then says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. So again, where did Jesus live? Nazareth. So when he went back home to Nazareth, what was he to his parents? He was subject to them. That means that he was living a life of servanthood. And so what are we learning from this? We're learning in Jesus, how did Jesus do such a marvelous work from 30 to 33 and a half? It's because it was in his servanthood in home that he increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and with men. Jesus was growing. Jesus was developing in his servanthood in his home. The reason Jesus did such a powerful public ministry is because he first learned to master serving in his home. Amen. Now, the reason why this is so important, my brothers and sisters, because remember, the Bible says in 1 John 2, in verse 6, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. And the word walk actually means to live. So as Jesus lived, we're supposed to live. And before Jesus went about doing an incredible public ministry, he first had to master serving in his home. It doesn't stop at Jesus because the reality is Jesus had followers. And I wonder what happened to all of those who were blessed by Jesus in his ministry. Notice what the Bible says. In Luke 5, it says, and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed where? To his house. And what was he doing at his house? Glorifying God. The first place we find that the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda. When this brother is healed, where is he going? He's going back to his house. What is he doing at his house? He is glorifying God at his house. Then when you look at John 4 and verse 53, so the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth and himself believed and his whole house. Then you look at Acts 18 and verse 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Acts 16 and verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So notice. Powerful biblical trend. It seems like every true believer of God always understood my first ministry is my home. The first place that I am called to exercise all of what God has given to me is in my home. And remember, the only people who receive the seal of God are those who serve and faithful service is calculated by God, not by what we do so much outside our home, but what we do inside our home. So my brothers and sisters, what that means is that depending on how you and I serve in our home, we're actually not even realizing we are either preparing for the mark of the beast or for the seal of the living God. And the question is, how are we doing with that? God wants us to understand the restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the home. That's always been the focus with God. And the problem that we have today is most of our homes are broken, brothers and sisters. Absolutely broken. You go to the average individual, how's your marriage? We have more complaints than praises. You go to individuals and you say, how are your children doing? And some of our children are so incredibly rebellious, disobedient. They struggle listening. 
and respecting and forgetting that, you know, we're so hard on them to, re to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but we are so loose with honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. The reality is that if you look at most of the homes happening today, our homes are broken. Our homes are going through tremendous trial. We have bitter wives and we have angry husbands and we have children that are looking for leadership and struggling to find it. One of the things that the Bible says about Jesus, it's interesting. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 14, talking about Jesus, it talks about him being the begotten of God, but it also talks about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And then it says, and he was full of grace and truth. Do you know how hard that is to demonstrate in a family? To be so balanced in our walk with God that we're full of grace and full of truth at the same time. You know, there's a lot of homes today where there's a lot of truth and very little grace. We're rough. We're unforgiving. We task and we task and we task. And when there's no fulfilling of the task, we discipline. You're full of truth, but you're thoroughly lacking in grace. We have other homes that we, you know, the children could do almost anything evil, ungodly, and uncouth. And we will go ahead and say, oh, let's just be merciful to the little kids. They're just children. We're so gracious that even our own children start taking advantage of us. They start realizing mom's not going to make a big deal out of it. Let's just go ahead and abuse her grace. You know why? Because there's so much grace, but there's a lack of truth. We become indulgent parents. We assist our children in rebellion and sin. And that is not either fun, funny, and it's definitely not the gospel. But oh, how hard it is to find a home where there's a proper balance like Jesus. Jesus full of grace and full of truth at the same time. That's a hard balance. Usually something gets imbalanced. Not so with Jesus, because Luke 18, 27 says that which is impossible with man is possible with God. We must understand that, yes, we can't do it. But with God's strength, we can do everything. You see, God wants us to understand that in these closing scenes of Earth's history, he wants us to recognize we are getting closer and closer to receiving that seal of the living God or that mark of the beast. And avoiding one and getting the other has a lot more to it, it is, uh, It's way more to do than just intellectually knowing stuff. We can know a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that we're going to follow on that knowledge. The reality of our preparation for the quote unquote final crisis is revealed in our home government. It's revealed, family. Because remember, the first war broke out in a home. The first war in heaven, it broke out in a home. The first war on earth, it broke out in a home. And in the last days of Earth's history, once again, we're going to see the home is central to our success or our failure. And this is why we have to find out what's the cure, what's the cause. Jesus makes it very clear. The cause is very simple. Why is there so much discord in families? Because without me, you can do nothing. Every time there's an argument, every time there's a fight, it's a testimony that somebody's disconnected from God. Proverbs 13 and verse 10 says, only by pride comes fighting. So when we fight husband and wife, it's Always. It's never, ever exempt from this family. Please hear me good. Look at it. Look it up. Proverbs 13, 10. Look it up when you get a chance. The first word says only. That means there's no room for anything else. It says only by pride comes fighting. That means every time husband and wife is fighting, somebody's being proud. And whoever's being proud, they are disconnected from Christ in that moment. And that's why Jesus says, without me, once you push me out and try to solve problems, Jesus says it'll never work. It's like a Band-Aid over a gushing wound at best. But what did Jesus also promise us? He also said here, he said, but remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
You can do anything. You might have been a bad father, but you don't have to close out your story like that. You might have been a bad husband, but you don't have to close out your story like that. You might have been a bad wife, but you don't have to close out your story like that. You might have been a rebellious child or an unthankful child, but guess what? You don't have to close out your story like that. God today is giving all of us an opportunity to get it right. But remember, in order to have that wonderful, beautiful, happy home, Jesus must be in the center. And this is what we're going to spend the next several weeks going over. Every Sabbath, our focus is how can I bring Christ into my marriage? How can I bring Christ into my parenthood? How can I bring Christ into my relation with my siblings? How can I bring Christ in me honoring my father and my mother? How can we deal properly even with our failures? And how God can help redeem us. All of it. Christ in the center. And so, my brothers and sisters, I'm here to let you know that there is a connection between the seal and the family. God wants us to understand that whatever condition our homes are in right now, it can change. God wants to give us hope. Remember, we are saved by hope. Romans 8 and verse 24. We're saved by hope. Hope is powerful. And love continually hopes. And so there might be some of us in this room who've gotten to a place of hopelessness. Maybe we've gotten to a place that we feel like, ah, oh, it's always going to be this way. Things will never change. God can do it for others, but he can't do it for me. No, don't believe those lies that Satan's telling you. Those are lies from Satan. I would recommend don't listen to serpents. God wants you to listen to the lamb, and the lamb is telling you that I can give you enough strength that I can change your life if you simply would let me. And so I'm wondering if there's anybody in this room under the sound of my voice that you recognize. And family, I can't tell you how serious I am about this. If you recognize the devil's been attacking my home. He's been trying to wreak havoc in my home. He's trying to steal my children from me because he is. He's trying to cause husbands and wives to be at difference one with another. He's trying to cause more disunity than unity. And if some of us can recognize that and say, listen, preacher, I want you to pray for me. And I'm willing to cooperate with God so he can accomplish great things, not just in me, but for my family. And that we're going to follow that biblical trend like Noah, like Jesus and like his many followers. We're going to follow that biblical trend that we're going to prioritize our home. So if you are in this room under the sound of my voice and you know that your home is in trouble and you also recognize that maybe you are part of that trouble, but you want God to do something special in your home and in your heart. If that's you, please stand to your feet with me. I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you because you're going to need it, brothers and sisters. This will be the greatest fight that we've ever entered. There's never a time that you stand for God and the devil does not show forth his ugly head. Never a time. And so as we get ready to enter this war, remember the world began with war and it's going to close with war. So what's important is that you're on the winning side. That's what's important. The world began with war in the family. The world is going to close with war in the family. But God says, I have a solution and I can give you victory. And so as you're standing, I want you to know Jesus stands with you. I'm going to encourage you. Come back, bring others, because this is for everybody. This is not an Adventist message. This is for everybody. And I want to encourage you to bring your friends out. Bring people you know that are struggling out. Let them come and hear how we can find the solution in Christ. Because I'm telling you right now, the world has already tried and failed miserably. The of ourselves, it's already proven. We've tried to solve our problems in our home for years. And everything just got worse. Teach us, Lord, how to surrender. I praise you and thank you for every precious soul who is standing under the sound of my voice. I'm trusting that there are people standing who's watching this over the Internet. I am praying, Father, please help us, Lord, because we desperately need your help. And may we come out victorious and praise you all the day long for what Christ has done, not just merely in our hearts, but in our homes. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus name. Let everyone say amen. amen.